Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidil mursalin ve alihi ve sahbihi ecmain. Rabbi zidna ilma ve la tuzigh kulubana ba'da iz hadaytana ve hab lana min ladunka rahmah inneke entel vehab. In these next 40 minutes or so that we have to gather, I would like in some type of conclusion share with you some of the ways and some of the akhlaq at the practical level of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. <clears throat> Remember we have established that the external actions are the result of an internal state of nafs. And that when the nafs is in some state of khuluq, then actions result effortlessly. And what you are going to hear is something perhaps you heard before. But remember, in the dhikra tanfa'u al-mu'mineen, says Allah Azza wa Jal. Reminders are helpful to those who have iman. And remember that it is about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam that we are speaking. And that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam acted when he acted the way he acted as a result of a nafs that is very, very refined, as a result of a state of an inner self that is very, very beautiful, that is in a state of tuma'nina, that is in a state of peace and stability and serenity, like that very calm pond of water that detects, that detects any type of uh, any type of interference through exhibiting ripples that nafs is very very sensitive so I begin by some of the akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam like that of that I mentioned earlier namely the khuluq of silence the khuluq of in other words using the tongue properly and we learned that part of his khuluq sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam anna kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana tawil as-samt as is described in the authentic texts he had prolonged intervals of silence and when he spoke as i said he spoke gems and diamonds and pearls and only that which is beneficial to himself and to his ummah in the quest of ubudiya to Allah Azza wa Jal. And that we therefore, emulating Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam's akhlaq, we are to, if we truly are on the quest of ubudiya to Allah Azza wa Jal, we are to struggle to develop that akhlaq of prolonged silence and that we begin to learn how to keep our tongue from speaking and as I said I think yesterday was it here that I said it maybe not here maybe somewhere else how about trying after this session to minimize the words you are going to utter not to speak when you desire to speak how about that Try that and see how challenging it is. And keep that as a rule, insha'Allah ta'ala, of practice. And you will never regret it. Usually they say, a person does not regret to have been quiet. But people have regretted to have spoken. That's why they say, إِذَا كَانَ الْكَلَامُ مِنْ فِضَّةٍ فَالسُّكُوتُ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ 
if speaking were to be of, go of silver, then quietness is of gold. And it is said uh, that Luqman al-Hakim said this hikmah in the following event. It is said that he was in the time of Dawood alayhi salam. And Dawood alayhi salam was manufacturing, was making a shield for the first time. For Allah azza wa taught him how to manufacture a shield in war. And Allah speaks about that, I believe, in Surah Al-Nahl. وَعَلَّمْنَاهُ صَنْعَةَ لَبُوسٍ لَكُمْ And then Luqman was in the court of Dawood alayhi salam and noticed that he was doing that for days. It was something new and he, and he was making that. And, and then he had the urge to speak, to ask him what it is that he was making. And they say, however, his hikmah, his wisdom restrained him from asking a question. So his hikmah restrained him from speaking then. Until such time when Dawood alayhi salam finished the manufacturing of that shield and then wore it to test it and said, and then as he wore it, Dawood alayhi salam said, Ni'ma dir'u lil harb. He said, alayhi salam, what means, oh, what an excellent shield it is for battle. Then Luqman alayhi salam said, Assamtu hukmun wa qalilun fa'iluh. Then it is said that Luqman uttered that word of hikmah and said, what means, silence is law in this version, law, hukm, and in a version, wisdom. Silence is law, and rare are those who practice it. After he, what happened to him then? He kept quiet. He had an urge to speak. He did not speak. And then the answer to his question came anyways. By patience. And by proper use of the faculties of the nafs, and therefore of the tongue in this case. So كان صلى الله عليه وسلم طويل الصمت. Number two of his خلق صلى الله عليه وسلم كان لا يضحك إلا تبسما. كان لا يضحك إلا تبسما. Remember now we're talking about external manifestations of the internal self. This text, this authentic text teaches that his laughter was always smile, was always a smile. In other words, he did not laugh as many of us do with a loud voice and a shattering sound and a disturbing noise and qaha qaha, uh, that qaha qaha that we say in Arabic, qaha qaha. In other words, when the person laughs loudly, ha ha ha, and, you know, that sound. And it is said, I believe Aisha said, or another companion in an authentic text, which means we have never seen Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he laughed. He, all, he laughed, but even when he laughed so, uh, so, so, so openly and with, with, with a full mouth in a sense, until you could see his back teeth. But he never laughed until you could see his, the, 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 the back of his of his throat. So his laughter was tabassum. He did not laugh loud. And remember some of us not only laugh loud but talk very loud. And talking very loud was not either the conduct, the external conduct of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was soft spoken but firm. Because also Allah Azza wa Jal says about those of us who speak loud, Allah Azza wa Jal politely says that those who speak loud are in a sense like, what? Like donkeys braying. What does Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Luqman when Luqman was advising his son? And then he says, 
وَغْضُضْ مِنْ صَوْتِكْ إِنَّ أَنْكَرَ الْأَصْوَاتِ لَصَوْتُ الْحَمِيرِ It's a polite way to say, uh, if when you speak loud, you are braying like a donkey. Because that ayah says, and look at the, subhanAllah, look at the Quranic adab. Allah teaches us that through the tongue of a creature of Luqman to his son, look at the indirect, polite ways that Allah Azzawajal uses. And then he says to him, Ya Bunay, oh my son, اغضض من صوتك, واغضض من صوتك, control your voice. In other words, lower the tone of your voice, اغضض. إن أنكر الأصوات لصوت الحمير The worst of sounds is the braying of the donkey. So he's telling him indirectly that in the in the in the in our values in our divine values, he who or she who speaks loud is like a donkey. And of course, remember, in the current culture of the world, the culture of lack of haya. The more aggressive we are, men and women, the more civilized we become. And the more we affirm ourselves. Isn't it true? Al-khumul wa tawadu' That becomes what? Becomes a sign of weakness. And a sign of subjugation, especially about women. Huh? Isn't it true? Women who speak soft and, oh, you still live in the medieval ages. You're still under the control of that chauvinist husband, isn't it? And all that intellectualization and legitimization of lack of haya. Remember, that's why some of our ulama have said, Al-haya hasanun, walakinnahu fi nisa'i ahsan. Haya is beautiful from every creature, every man and woman. But from women, it is even more beautiful. Rasulullah said to a companion in an authentic text, whom he saw admonishing his brother and telling him, you know, this haya is not, is not going to take you anywhere. You have heard that before? You're too shy. You're not aggressive enough. This haya is not going to take you anywhere. And then Rasulullah sallallahu our master psychologist. Ya Rasulullah, forgive me for this analogy. I just only intend to, to elucidate a case. And then he told him, Da'hu, fa'inna al-haya'a kulluhu khayr. He told him, leave him. Haya, all of it is good. An aggressive behavior and shouting and loudness that becomes an example of civility, an example of, uh, of advancement, an example of ability, isn't it? And we also, many of us, believe that now. And it has become part of our lives, unfortunately. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was described كان رسول الله كان أشد حياء من العذراء في خدرها This text describes him, his حياء His حياء was more intense, more pronounced, more obvious than the حياء of an unmarried young woman in her private quarter this tells us some other things, of course. Once upon a time, unfortunately for now, yes, a young woman, especially unmarried, was the most beautiful expression of hair. To the extent that she cannot even say, not she cannot, some of them wouldn't even say, yes, I want to marry this man. That statement was an expression of lack of hair. And therefore, in that culture, says Rasulullah if she doesn't respond, because it's a culture of hayat, that means yes, I want to marry this man.
إِذَا لَمْ تَسْتَحِي فَصْنَعْ مَا شِئْتِ سَادِهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ What means, if you have no haya, you're going to do as you please. Which means, those people who say, do what you like. Give the reins to your nafs. That is an expression of lack of haya. And therefore, a person who lets his nafs or her nafs guide and lead and hold the reins, that person has no hair. And remember, hair is the defining characteristic of this deen. Inna li kulli deen in khuluqa wa inna khuluqa al Islam al haya, said Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this authentic text. Every deen has its own defining characteristic, and the khuluq, the state, remember, of nafs, the defining characteristic of Islam is haya. And he said, الْحَيَاءُ وَالْإِيمَانُ قُرِنَا جَمِيعًا فَإِذَا رُفِعَ أَحَدُهُمَا رُفِعَ الْآخَرُ Subhanallah. He said, I didn't. I'm only a student. He said, صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم, إيمان, essential. And حياء قُرِنَا جَمِيعًا They have been always held together. If one of them is lifted, then the other one is lifted. That means what? If there is Iman, there is Haya. If there is no Iman, there is no Haya. If there is little Iman, there is little Haya. If there is a lot of Iman, there is a lot of Haya. If there is no Haya, there is no Iman. In other words, these are indicators, if you will, by which we gauge, if you will, the level of Iman of ourselves and of our surroundings. Haya. Did I say here yesterday, did I speak of the root of Haya yesterday? No, no. okay. No. So, subhanAllah, Haya is indeed the characteristic of this deen. And look, even in the language itself, it is expressed. Because haya, the root of haya is hayya. And the root of haya, what is haya? Life. And haya is this characteristic that we're talking about. And when you in the Arabic language say, istahya fulan. Istahya in the Arabic language, this word is, if you will, uh, is, is a... Um, uh, is, is a homonym. One word has more than one meaning. Istahya means to show haya. But also it means to resuscitate, to give life, to keep alive. As if this Quran and this deen is telling us what? If there is no haya, there is no haya. In other words, a life without haya is not a life. It is a life, remember, of the lowest three levels of the nafs. Life in that sense. But not life in the level sought. The level of al nafsu al malaikiya And if we live without haya, we are like cattle, like predators. Like shayateen wal ayyadu billah. Yet haya is one of those things that would disappear and would be would become rare commodities, if you will, of alamatu sa'a. And sorry, I am sorry, I am I regret to observe, and may Allah help me myself as well, that in the Muslim communities in the world and in this country, we have espoused a lot of lack of hair values in our conduct with each other, individually, in our families, and so on. We have taken those lack of hair values. And your Rasul said, 
إن لكل دين خلقا وإن خلق الإسلام الحياة. I translated that already. Remember that. And he had more hair than a young unmarried woman in her private quarters. The young unmarried woman in her private quarters. Because she used to be the best, the most beautiful expression of this most beautiful characteristic of this deen. Until such time when through what I call moral entropy, the increase of moral entropy, that is the decadence in morality, until, subhanallah, aggressive behavior, aggressive dress, please allow me, becomes the norm. Until our children, when they become 17, they don't even know what haya means. And they feel very comfortable in the ways they are. Because, forgive me, forgive me, I have to say these words for me to learn. And then perhaps for you. We have cultivated in our children more of the cattle-like nafs and the predator-like nafs and the shaitani-like nafs. An imbalanced nafs. However, remember, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Allah's rahma is open. Allah's gates are still open until the last breath of life. We still have time. But realize that those who started before us are far ahead in their journey. We begin late, we'll arrive late. But hopefully at least we will arrive. It is never late, insha'Allah ta'ala ya Rabb, to begin the course. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam was very gentle, was very rafiq, very rafiq, very soft. But he was also very stern when it comes to the hudud of Allah Azza wa Jal, to the rights of Allah Azza wa Jal, when it comes to the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal, he was a balanced nafs. He was not an environmentalist, you know what I mean? Nor was he a pacifist, you know what I mean? He was better than an environmentalist. His compassion for the environment was a compassion that originates in the source of compassion, Allah Azza wa Jal. And therefore what I learn from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let's say in his akhlaq with the environment, is much more noble than that of an environmentalist stripped from the notion of Allah Azza wa Jal. I, through the teaching of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, see every ant in dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. I see every leaf in dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. I see every bee in dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. I see every insect in dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. I see every stream of water, every breeze of wind in dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. So I revere Allah Azza wa Jal. And therefore I revere because of Allah his creature. Especially that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught me through the Qur'an that all of those creatures are communities like ourselves. And that they are in dhikr of Allah azza wa jal. And that the mountains celebrate and communicate with each other and they ask each other, did someone today pass by you who was in dhikr of Allah azza wa jal? Did you know that? The hadith teaches that mountains and Parts and parcels of, of, of earth are in communication with each other. And they say to each other, did today someone pass by you in dhikr of Allah Azza wa If one mountain says yes, they celebrate. Oh, lucky you. Because they are all in celebration. They are all in dhikr of Allah Azza wa And to be brief, that's why I am compassionate with the environment. I am not an environmentalist. 
I am better than that. For the environmentalist sees in that many of them, they only see in that an opportunity for enjoyment, and that's it. It's another toy, if you will, to enjoy without greater purpose. Can't you see? Do you see with me? Which one is more noble? Which one is more profound? Which one is even, let me borrow the word, more sophisticated? Which one? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was very rafiq, very gentle with all the creatures of Allah azza wa humans, animals, plants, all alike. One day he was with his companions in this authentic text and they rested in one of those expeditions. And then there was a tree in which there was a nest of a bird called Al-Hummara. Al-Hummara, probably it was a bird with a red neck. And then some companion saw that and went to the nest and picked the fledglings. And you know what happened? The mother comes flying. You see, have you seen a bird? When you come close to their nest or if you violate their territory, what do they do? Flying everywhere. Rasulullah sees that and says, Man ruddu ilayha waladaha. Says Sallallahu Alaihi who horrified this mother by taking her fledglings. Return to her her fledglings. His qalb Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so polished that he detected the pain in the little heart of the little bird. Just return to her her fledglings. And he said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam من غرس غرسا أو زرع زرعا فأكل منه إنسان أو حيوان أو طير كانت له صدقة وفي رواية مسلم وما سرق له صدقة سبحان الله he teaches صلى الله عليه وسلم that whosoever plants some plants and vegetation or some crops even and of that vegetation or of those plants or those crops humans eat or animals eat or birds eat then it will be a sadaqa for that person and in another teaching and that which is stolen from it is a sadaqa for that person it I lament in my heart and it hurts me to see the non-Muslim having bird feed, spending money, really, to feed the birds. And we teach our children to kill the birds. To the extent that there used to be jokes in some Muslim countries and, and that's the culture because jokes express sometimes the state of a culture the types of jokes if you will there was this bird teaching his baby about uh, safety issues in life and says to him if you see a human being Holding a stone, run, fly away. And then if you see in those days in that country, it said, where I came from, it said, and if you see an Arab bending, run. Because he's going to pick a stone to kill you. Is this what we became? Is this the khuluq of Rasulullah sallallahu And rest assured, he who or she who is easy at killing an insect, not only a bird, 
has the potential of killing unjustly a human life. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna Allah Rafiqun Yuhibbu Rifq, Wa Yu'ti Ala Rifqi Ma La Yu'ti Ala Al Unf, Wa Ma La Yu'ti Ala Siwa. Hadithun Sahih. Says he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what means Allah is a Rafiq, Allah is gentle, and loves gentleness, Yuhibbu Rifq, and rewards as the result of rifq as the result of gentleness, that which he does not reward as the result of violence, nor as a result of anything else. Says he, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That's why his approach was always an approach of rifq, unless it becomes impossible, and then deen or life or property are seriously endangered. And there is no other way to remedy it by rifq. Some of us begin with the end. And we are very hasty to saying, I have done enough. Or I have been very gentle. Remember, that statement, or have been gentle, depends on what nafs I am, remember? So he was Rafiq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One day, he was walking with Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha. They were walking together, and yes, husband and wife walk together. Right? Even if some of our brothers in some Muslim cultures don't like that, well, Rasulullah sallallahu walked alongside his wife. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala. Even in 14th century's culture of what you call it, some of you call it the desert culture. And he walked with her, sallallahu alayhi wa but with that haya of Aisha. If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi had haya, Aisha had haya radiallahu ta'ala anha arda. Anyways, however, they were walking and it was the habit at that time of some of the non-Muslim tribes of the people of the book to ridicule Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and to be malicious in the words they use. So instead of saying assalamu alaykum, they used to say assalamu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum. Does it remind you of anything? Some people from different cultures? Yeah, isn't it? Assalamu alaykum. I say it right? No? Almost? Almost. You're half Pakistani, we know that. Slaliku. Slaliku. What is Slaliku? Subhanallah, Ittaqullah. Ittaqullah. So, those guys, of course, it's, it, they mean Salaamu Alaikum, but. So, those used to say Salaamu Alaikum quickly. And there are some Arabs actually say Salaamu Alaikum. Salaamu Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Subhanallah, ismun min asma'illahi azza wa jal, who by his generosity allowed it to be used amongst us, that's the way we use it. And that means there is no qalb with it. There is no qalb with it. Anyways, as-salam, as-salam means death. So they used to say to the, to the companions, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Salamu alaykum fast becoming salamu alaykum and they mean death be upon you. And the companions knew that and Rasulullah knew that. That was, they were hostile tribes, some of them. So he was working with Aisha, one of them passes and says, salamu alaykum. And Rasulullah answered, wa alaykum, and upon you. <laughs> it's not laughing, wallahi, it's... But Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha who was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says Wa alaykum usamu Wa ghadib allahu alaykum wa la'anakum Wa a'adda lakum a'adaban azeema Something like that Then Aisha radiallahu ta'ala replied And may death be upon you And the anger and the wrath of Allah azza wa jal She was hurt And that's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Not just her husband 
Now that's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And then, subhanAllah, in this occasion, many of us would say, oh, they deserve more than that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa this this ocean of peace, subhanAllah. He says to Aisha, Mahlan ya Aisha. Mahlan ya Aisha. In other words, like what? Take it easy, Aisha. Mahlan ya Aisha. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Alayki bir rifq wa iyaki wal unf, fa inna rifq ma kana fi shayin illa zana, wa man tuzi'a min shayin illa shana. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Aisha, be in other words gentler. For he says, and beware of unf. Be gentle, be rafiqah, and beware of unf, of violence. For he said, what means, whenever rifq is introduced in anything, it beautifies it. And whenever it is stripped from anything, it makes it ugly. Says Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Of his khuluq also, for example, in forgiving, and I would say as a means of da'wah to Allah Azza wa Jal. Forgiving when it comes to hurting him, yet hurting him is hurting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not just Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Correct? Because many of us sometimes in, 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 in Sharia studies, we try to distinguish between Muhammad the man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad the rasul, Muhammad the legislator, Muhammad the ruler, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and sometimes there are different ahkam. Yet he is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in all those instances. And if someone, let's say, if someone wants to assassinate the President of the United States, would anybody look at it as he was going to assassinate the person, Bill Clinton? No. It is an affront to the entire people of the United States. And to the law of the United States, and the constitution of the United States, and to the principles of the United States, right? We don't look at it, oh, it's, it's a personal matter. Yet look, subhanAllah, at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Examples. In one of those expeditions, they rested for Qaylula, for the midday rest. And there were many, and of course they were dispersed. And Rasulullah وسلم, like any one of them, was also laying down alone under a tree. And relaxing. Suddenly, a spy of the kuffar who are always on the look for opportunities to kill Rasulullah sallallahu And one of them actually, by the name of Gawrath ibn al-Harith, infiltrated the camp and with his sword at the throat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And in that moment of his temporary glory, as he thought, he said to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man ya'asimuka minni ya Muhammad. All of, all of this was very fast. Hmm? He says to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what means, who shall shield you from me now, O Muhammad? Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, imagine please that with me. Laying down, and remember what nafs he had, mutma'inna, that ocean of peace. He said, Allah! What is this? He said, man ya'asimuka minni, the sword in his throat. Who shields you from me, O Muhammad? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answers, Allah! And the sword falls from the hand of Al Ghawrath. And Rasulullah was an agile man. 
He picked the sword and now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pointing at the neck and the throat of Al-Ghawrath and says to him, Man ya'asimuka minni ya Ghawrath. Now who will shield you from me, ya Ghawrath? Ghawrath says, Ya Muhammad, kun khayra akhid. Oh Muhammad, in other words, please be generous. Take it easy. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know what he did? Go, Gawrath, you're free. Bi abi anta wa ummi ya Rasulullah. Go, ya Gawrath, you're free. Look where we are. And we talk about our failures. Why? Why are we failing politically, economically, militarily, socially, in da'wah? What is da'wah? Many of us in da'wah are so angry da'iyah. So angry da'iyah. And as if da'wah is a curse on other human beings. Sometimes, some expressions of da'wah are like a piece of hot iron on those who don't know. On another instance, another authentic text, the companions capture one of the noblemen of the tribes of the pagans. And they capture him and his name was Thumama. And they capture him and they tie him to a column in the masjid. And they wait for Rasulullah to come. He was an avowed enemy. And one of the leaders and the noblemen of the hostile tribes of Quraysh. Then Rasulullah comes and, and sees Thumama and recognizes Thumama in the, in the court of the masjid. And says, Ha Thumama, ماذا عندك يا Thumama? He talks to him in this way. Ha, ماذا عندك يا Thumama? What do you have to say, O Thumama? Not like in a violent tone or... Ha, ماذا عندك يا Thumama? What do you have, O Thumama? What do you have to say? Thumama, a noble man, رجل شريف, but a kafir, says, يا محمد, إن تقتل تقتل ذا دم وإن تعفو تعفو عن شاكر وإن كنت تريد المال فاسأل تعطى ما شئت First, Umama says, Umama says, يا محمد, if you kill me, you're going to kill someone with a lot of blood. If you want blood, I have plenty of blood. Go ahead. Look at that noble man. <laughs> Courageous, noble, truthful. And look how Rasulullah recognizes the good qualities of people, no matter who they are. And then he continues to tell him, and if you forgive and pardon, you will pardon someone who is thankful. Hmm. And then he tells him, and if you want wealth, ask, you will be given what you want. If you want ransom, ask, you will be given what you want. Rasulullah ﷺ seeing that character. Subhanallah, look at him. He says, Utluqu Thumama. Let Thumama go free. This is a free man. This is a free mind. This is a free heart by the ilm that Allah Azza wa gave Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, certainly. Thumama goes, washes, comes back and says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah. This is an authentic text. This is not in books of legends, of very weak texts, texts or spurious texts. 
And then he says, Ya Muhammad, Wallahi, ma kana wajhun ala al-ardi abghada ilayya min wajhik. فأصبح اليوم وجهك أحب الوجوه إلي وما كان دين على الأرض أبغض إلي من دينك فأصبح دينك أحب الأديان إلي الله أكبر how Allah عز وجل changes the قلب and says to him what means يا محمد you there was no face on the face of the earth that was more despised to me than yours he tells him that now, Ya Muhammad, your face becomes the most beloved face to me on the face of the earth. And there was no deen, no religion more despised to me than yours. Now, your religion is the most beloved way to me in this world. His khuluq of afu of gentleness, of hikmah, leads to such responses. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. One more account and I close. In the akhlaq of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Unless you want me to stop and you want to have physical food, I shall stop. Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this text, you know, if you don't know, you must know, if you know it, in the dhikra tanfa'ul mu'mineen. He was in the masjid. Masjid and nabawi imagine that? Comes a Bedouin and picks a corner in the masjid, and masjid and nabawi and starts to urinate. In the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And one salah in the masjid in Nabawi is worth 1,000 salah in any other masjid. Except al-masjid al-haram. Guess what? Sahaba, the companion, saw him. And they jump at him. And they run to really probably in their ways to do something very perhaps harmful to him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw that and saw the man urinating says, Da'uhu, da'uhu, la tuzrimuh. <laughs> leave him, leave him, do not interrupt him. Bi abi anta wa ummi ya Rasulullah. But before I continue the land of the story, this comes from a nafs, from a khuluq. These ways of conduct will not come to you and me naturally without struggling to purify the nafs. We will never behave this way if the nafs is in a state of ailment and is darkened by obscurities and filth and impurities. And then he says to them, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, كُبُّ عَلَيْهِ أَوْ صُبُّ عَلَيْهِ دَلْوًا مِنَ الْمَاءِ he says, go get a bucket of water, he tells his companions, and just rinse it. Just put it on the, on that, and it's okay. And then he talks to the person, yeah, fulan, gently, this masjid is not meant for those things. This masjid is meant for dhikrullah azza wa jal, and for salah, and for tilawatul Qur'an, and for these things. And not for shouting either. Alhamdulillah. And not for shouting either and backbiting each other, and hitting and striking each other in the message of Allah Azza wa Jal, and raising the voices in the message of Allah Azza wa Jal. Ah, where are we? And then we think, oh, why are we not leaders of the civilized world? What? What? Alhamdulillah that we are not at this time. Because this deen would have been given the worst of all impressions. Allah Azza wa Jal, when he gives leadership, he gives, it, he gives it to those who deserve it. And oftentimes we don't question ourselves 
We question the other. The other. I'm so innocent. I don't deserve anything as an individual and as a society. So he taught him وسلم, that the masajid of Allah جل, are not like that. And he taught him so gently and kindly and persuasively and the man so elated, a Bedouin, but eloquent, says after that he made a dua, Allahumma arhamni wa muhammada wa la tarham ma'ana ahada. <laughs> Don't say amin to that one. So the Bedouin says, Allahumma arhamni wa muhammada wa la tarham ma'ana ahada. Ya Allah, give me rahma and muhammad and no one else with us. And then Rasulullah replies and teaches him something else. And he tells him, Ya hadha laqad hajjarta wasi'a. He tells him, oh man, you have restricted someone who is very magnanimous. Huh? Not only you and me, include everyone else, please. My dear brothers and sisters, these are some if you will, of the breezes from the beautiful winds of the beautiful akhlaq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And that they originate in a nafs, in a state of itma'nan. And that in order to conduct ourselves in this manner, or something remotely close to it, we have to, we must embark. Yesterday, long time ago, not only tomorrow, in the process of Tezkiyah to Anfusina. And I ask Allah Azza wa to infuse in your hearts and in mine the desire and the longing to do that. And to learn sincerely and genuinely and studiously how to do that. And then we attain happiness in this dunya and we give it to others. And happiness in akhirah, insha'Allah ta'ala. And Allah will grant us the authority of shafa'ah to give that happiness to others as well on the day of judgment. Aqulu qawli hadha وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروه طوبى للمستغفرين إن قلت صوابا فمن الله وحده إن قلت غير ذلك فمن نفسي ومن جهلي ومن الشيطان أعوذ بالله أن أذكر به وأنساه والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته